Support for political violence has absolutely skyrocketed. This is interesting. Take a look from Axios. About one in three Americans believes that violence against the government can at times be justified. A year out from the deadly January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol, a poll by the Washington Post and the University of Maryland uh, found out Saturday. It's the largest share of respondents to hold that view in similar polls in the last two decades, according to the Post, which said the findings offer a window into the country's psyche at a tumultuous period in American history. It comes after last year's insurrection, the rise of Trump's election claims as energizing as an energizing force for the right, deepening fissures over the government's role in combating the pandemic, and mounting racial justice protests sparked by police killings of black Americans, writes the Post. A majority of adults still say violence is never justified, but that number, 62%, is a new low per the Post. Some 90% believed it was never justified in the 1990s. Wow. Used to be 90%, now it's 62%. The new poll found that 40% of Republicans and 41% of independents said violence can be acceptable compared with just 23%, that's still a high number, of Democrats. 40% of white Americans said violence can be justified compared with 18% of black Americans. The percentage of adults who said violence is justified was 23% in 2015 and 16% in 2010 in polls by CBS News and the New York Times, respectively. People's reasoning for what they considered acceptable violence against the government varied from what they considered to be overreaching coronavirus restrictions, the disenfranchisement of minority voters, to the oppression of Americans, the Post writes. And then that last line is the most interesting to me. Respon uh, responses to an open-ended question on the survey about hypothetical justifications, including repeated mentions of autocracy, tyranny, corruption, and loss of freedoms. Wow. So when, when they ask people in an open-ended sense, seriously, when do you think violence would be justified? People said, when when it's an autocracy and no longer a democracy, when it's a tyranny and no longer a democracy, when there's endless corruption and when there's a loss of freedom. This is hitting a little too close to home, isn't it? Again, I'm floored by that fact. Well, not really, but this is really the chickens coming home to roost in many respects but it used to be 90% that political said political violence is never acceptable now it's only 62% this is or it should be but it won't be a wake up call to the elites a wake up call to the powers that be they're in their ivory towers looking down at everybody else they do not understand the pain the hurt the suffering, the complete institutional collapse and failure. Americans feel completely left behind by their government. They know the government doesn't represent them in any way, shape, or form. By the way, we know this as a matter of fact because every time they do a poll on Congress, the approval rating varies between like 8% and 23%. This is supposed to be the body that represents us. That is our voice when it comes to governing the country. They clearly do not do that. Everybody knows you're always voting for a lesser of two evils. And that's why everybody hates Congress. I mean, look at that fact, for real. Between 8% and 23% approval rating for Congress. It's a shock that this number is not even higher, the number of people who believe in political violence. Only 62% are opposed to it now. And, I, you know... Maybe some of you at the beginning of this segment thought, oh, well, it was just, you know, it's just the, the Trump people who are saying we believe in political violence. No. It's also people who feel like the cops are out of control and the war on drugs is out of control and there's institutional political violence against people of color and poor people. It's also people who say, look, they're restricting our right to vote. You had the Supreme Court not too long ago slap down aspects of the Voting Rights Act 
And then all these red states went right back to the same tricks they used to do in the freaking 1960s. Trying to disenfranchise minority voters. So, it's not just right-wingers. When, what was it, 40%, 41% of independents say it? There are plenty of left-leaning independents who say it. And then, again, when you ask people more specifically, they say, when it feels tyrannical, or it feels like we're in an autocracy, or we're losing our freedoms, or there's tyranny, or there's, excuse me, corruption, maybe it is justified at that point in time. Maybe violence is okay at that point in time. Now look, this gets into a much broader conversation about the idea of political violence, and when is it acceptable, when is it not acceptable, is it ever acceptable? And that's way too complex a conversation to have in the context of this story right now. But just know the answers are not as black and white and clear as you may think they are. Now, I'm generally more of a proponent of the Martin Luther King uh, School of Change than I am the Malcolm X School of Change. And actually, that's not really fair because Malcolm X did stress self-defense more than any sort of offensive violence. But let's just say I'm more of the MLK School of Thought than the riot school of thought, if you will. But you have to try to understand where riots come from. And even MLK himself said it's the language of the unheard, or it's the voice of the unheard. When other means fail, people sort of resort to, all right, well, you guys are breaking the law relentlessly. Well, we can do it too. Watch. Um, and even Noam Chomsky, brilliant as he is. And look, he's an opponent of most offensive forms of violence. He very famously said Antifa is a giant gift to the right. Those are things I, I agree with him on. But even he gives uh, an intellectual justification that I think makes perfect sense. He says, when is uh, violence justified? Well, let's say you have a shipment of tanks or airplanes or some sort of weaponry that you know is about to be used to massacre landless peasants in Vietnam. They're going to use napalm or Agent Orange or... Whatever. Some sort of deadly weapons to massacre innocent peasants, landless peasants, villagers in Vietnam. You know it's about to be used in a genocidal act of war. And you don't see any people around. And you have the opportunity to destroy uh, this shipment of whatever it is. Tanks, airplanes, weapons. Do you destroy it? Well, he says, in that instance... That is absolutely justifiable. In this case, property damage, property violence. I have a hard time coming up with an argument against that. No individual is getting hurt, and you are at the very least postponing war crimes and a genocidal activity. In that instance, it is the ethical thing. It is the moral thing to do property violence. So now I could come up here and probably think up an, a number of scenarios where uh, that kind of violence is justified, but generally speaking, I lean on the side of nonviolence, especially when it comes to people. I do believe in self-defense, though. You can always do violence as, uh, you know, a means to, to protect yourself if somebody else is being offensively uh, aggressive and violent. But point is, it's a much more complex conversation, a nuanced conversation than anybody likes to give it credit for. And uh, I'm not going to flippantly, I'm not going to give some flippant commentary here that acts like it's never possible for violence to be okay. Um, because there's also institutional violence, which, uh, in official circles, they don't count it as violence. How is it not a form of violence if, um, 45,000 Americans die every year because they don't have basic health care? How's that not a form of violence? That's institutional violence. How is it not a form of violence and authoritarianism and oppression when the government locks you up for freely deciding to put a substance in your own body and you're not hurting anybody else? That is a form of violence. So there's institutional violence, which counts, but they don't count it in official circles. This is one of the biggest frustrations of the left. I mean, look at state violence. I mean, this is the best example of it. So when you have one terrorist put on a suicide vest and kill people, that's an act of terrorism. But if you have a U.S. drone bomb women and children and kill them, that doesn't count. As terrorism, they say that's well, that's collateral damage. We didn't mean to do it, we meant well, but we messed up and that happened. Well, if you do that a thousand times over, I have to question your intentions. And at the very least, you don't care that you're killing women and children. So, how 
how different is the moral culpability there? Why don't we call that terrorism? We need to call that terrorism. So, it's a much more nuanced conversation than people like to think. And again, the main point here is this is a wake-up call to elites, or it should be. Get your fucking act together. You know, FDR famously said something along the lines of, look, if we don't take some of your money, people are going to take all your money. So if we don't tax the wealthy and redistribute in the form of a jobs program and in the form of uh, various social safety net programs, it's going to get ugly. And what's crazy is they're so disconnected from reality, the elites, they have no idea. They have no idea. They don't know what the pain is like out there. They don't know what the suffering is like out there. They don't know that people are on the brink of complete and utter catastrophe and uh, economic failure and social failure and civilizational collapse. And so they're going along their merry way and um, oblivious to what's happening right underneath their noses. Well, at some point, this number might get to the point of no return. I think there are way too many good distractions for us to ever have like a, a civil war in this country again, but I, I definitely think it's possible that we have widespread um, rioting and civilizational and institutional collapse and failure. And, you know, you just got a little taste of it with January 6th. You just got a little taste of it with the George Floyd uh, protests and riots in the wake of that. Imagine that happening all over the country over a variety of different reasons. That is definitely possible. Definitely possible. And if they don't wake up and address the needs and concerns of the American people, it's going to get worse and worse. End the drug war. Um, legalize drugs. Release all the nonviolent drug offenders. You have to do some sort of police reform. You have to... Um, address the material and economic concerns of the American people so that there is no need to scapegoat the other and you, you have xenophobia and bigotry drop instead of increase. When there's a chicken in every pot, you don't really need to blame other people for your problems because your problems aren't nearly as bad. So you need to give people health care, you need to, need to give people higher wages, you need to give people education, you need to abolish the student loan debt. Um, you need to do these things or it's only going to get worse and worse and worse and... The pandemic has just exacerbated all of these, all of these ills. And now, of course, there's that big split on pandemic restrictions. A lot of people are for them, and then a lot of people are against them, and um, they are inherently restrictive and authoritarian, regardless of whether or not you agree with them or not, and that's just adding fuel to the fire. So, this is a scary thing, man. It is absolutely a scary thing, and we're living through history. Ever since Adpocalypse, when YouTube defunded all independent news and politics overnight, we haven't trusted them. We know they can pull the rug out from underneath us at any time. If you enjoy this content, please consider tipping a dollar or two per month on the Secular Talk Patreon. Link in the video description box below. Thanks for your support.